Thank you for having me today to discuss balloon undilatable lesions and a potential algorithm to use in the cath lab. When you think of lesion complexity, you think of calcium, tortuosity, high thrombus burden, and diffuse atherosclerotic burden. Calcium is probably the most challenging and most likely to adversely impact acute and long-term results after percutaneous coronary intervention in the contemporary era. The overall goal is adequate lesion preparation to prevent stent under expansion and thereby decrease the rates of instant restenosis and stent thrombosis. This is critical that we want to be able to have a stent that's in place that's both well opposed and well expanded. There are several imaging techniques to detect calcium. However, starting with angiography, angiography alone will really only identify calcification in only 38% 30 of cases, as it depends on the arch of calcium present. Uh, the more severe the calcium, the more likely you are to be able to detect it by angiography. In other cases, you would need some sort of intravascular imaging to fully understand the depth and the extent of calcium. Looking at the difference between IVUS and OCT, OCT can give you some three-dimensional parameters, while IVUS is better at looking at deep wall calcium. So here are just some picture examples of, of image, uh, calcified lesions by IVUS. This is an example of some luminal calcium and an example of deep wall calcium. Again, IVUS is better to differentiate between the two, uh, better than OCT. Here's an example of 180 degree arch of calcium and an example of concentric calcium on IVUS. And then looking at OCT, you can get a sense of the lesion, uh, the calcified lesion itself, both the thickness as well as the extent. On IVUS, you would need to do an automated pullback to get a better idea of the calcific length. This is an example of non-concentric calcium on OCT and another example of concentric calcium on OCT. So despite its limitations, OCT is more accurate than IVUS in defining the calcific burden because it does allow them to measure the parameters on top of the calcific arch. So you can look at thickness, length, area, and uh, calculate three-dimensional volume. And it does uh, predict scent expansion in response to balloon dilation in small imaging studies. There's a score overall that you can use, uh, calcific arch greater than 180 degrees, uh, calcific longitudinal length greater than 5 millimeters, and calcific thickness greater than half a millimeter are all important uh, parameters to look at, such that there's a higher risk of stent under expansion with higher scores. If you wanted to look at a potential algorithm, here's an example. The first question is, is, the, is there balloon crossability of the lesion? If so, can you deliver an intravascular imaging device? If you can't, you may require a small predilation, uh, but then you really should consider intravascular imaging to get a sense of the arch, length, and thickness. And then it depends. If these three parameters look like they're at higher risk of not expanding, you want to ask and, or see if there's evidence of deep wall calcium. Uh, uh, more often than not, atherectomy will be a good approach, whether it's rotational or orbital atherectomy. And then after atherectomy is performed, it's important to double check the, that the lesion does optimally expand with balloon dilation. If there's deep uh, wall calcium, you could consider a lithoplasty balloon instead of atherectomy itself. If these high-risk parameters are not in, in place, then you may consider a balloon approach. I personally prefer a cutting or scoring balloon that would allow uh, some fracture of the calcium before, uh, before going up with a non-compliant balloon to higher pressures. But again, you want to make sure that there's optimal balloon expansion. And if there's not, at this point, you may have created some mini dissections. It may be best to proceed to a lithoplasty balloon. If you cannot cross the lesion with the balloon, uh, more often than not, you can directly wire the lesion with, ro uh, with a rotowire um, uh, or a viper wire. Uh, people are always surprised when I say this, but honestly, 9 out of 10, I'm direct wiring these lesions uh, with, with the, the atherectomy wire. Um, if you cannot wire the lesion and you cannot cross it, um, 
you can at this point consider laser atherectomy. And again, after this atherectomy is performed, you still want to ensure optimal balloon expansion before proceeding to stent placement. Because if the balloon is still not expanding, you do have the option of a lithoplasty balloon. Looking at calcium phenotypes, here is a circumferential uh, calcium, but it's very thin. And so you can see with the thin phenotypes, you could consider PTCA and get a good result. Here's just an example of a thin phenotype. Again, first with a non-compliant balloon, you see that there isn't a great expansion. So we went ahead with a cutting balloon, and the cutting balloon created enough fractures in the, the thin calcium that you now had optimal balloon expansion with the subsequent non-compliant balloon. It's one of the reasons why I do prefer cutting balloons in these cases rather than a non-compliant balloon. The mechanism of the cutting balloon is such that it creates injury localized to the site of cutting by severing elastic and fibrotic continuity of the plaque. Uh, they're lower compliant balloons, they dilate at lower pressures, and there's a reduced risk of trauma. So here in pathology, you can see that media, there's no visible disruption, the endothelial layer is intact, but you can create these cracks in the calcium to then allow uh, balloon expansion with a non-compliant balloon at high atmospheres. Cutting balloon is a non-compliant balloon surrounded by three to four longitudinal microtomes. If you're looking at the newer generation balloons, the functional height with the blades is exactly the same. It's just on a more narrow platform to increase deliverability. There's also scoring balloons. These are semi-compliant balloons with the helical nitinol scoring element. And some newer generation scoring balloons have these nitinol grooves allowing these pillow-like uh, shape to dilate the vessel. Looking at balloons versus ablation, balloons increase the plaque elasticity but do not remove the calcium. And then rotational and orbital atherectomy modify plaque, plaque composition with a selective action on hard calcified components, uh, but uh, um, they crack the calcium. They do not necessarily debulk. Rotational atherectomy is a high-speed rotating diamond coated burr. The motor converts compressed gas into rotational energy. Recently, the newer generation device of Rotopro has design changes that, were are, that are meant to allow for a single operator use. And then with a higher speed, we don't really see an, a difference in incidence of slow flow. And so if you need more cutting, you can go up on the rotational speed. But it's important to do a slow pecking motion. Here's just an example of a concentric thick calcium on OCT, where if you treated it with PTCA alone, you're going to be left with a severely stent under expansion. Whereas, again, another lesion with severe uh, concentric thick calcium treated with rotational atherectomy followed by balloon angioplasty, you can see a much better expansion of the lesion. In the recently randomized PrEP calc trial, 200 patients with severe calci calcified lesions were randomized to rotational atherectomy versus cutting or scoring balloon, and there was a greater procedural success with rotational atherectomy versus modified balloon approach with no signal for harm. So again, the more severely calcified lesions, you want to consider atherectomy. Here's just a case example of a lesion that was started off uh, to perform a PCI of a calcified Prox LAD lesion. Uh, we started with PCI with a 1,5 rota burr. The balloon still did not fully inflate, and there was a residual dissection. In this particular lab, we did not have access to switch over to orbital atherectomy. Ivis confirmed a thick concentric ring of calcium, and so what we ended up doing was ping-ponging the guide, getting alternative access, upsizing the guide, and then running a 2-0 burr, and then we had good stent expansion. The key take-home point here is that if you cannot prep the lesion adequately, it is worth getting alternative access and upsizing the guide before even considering placing a stent in an underexpanded lesion. Orbital atherectomy is an eccentrically mounted diamond coated 125 millimeter crown. It's powered by a pneumatic console. Unlike rotational atherectomy, the crown has diamond chips on the front and the back, allowing ablation, antegrade, and retrograde. And with this, however, instead of a slow pecking motion, requires a continuous mo movement. And there you we have what a sand, what we call a quote-unquote sanding action of the calcific component. With faster speeds, you can increase the diameter cover, and so this does allow uh, larger uh, lesions to be sanded using just a six French guide.
Here's an example of an eccentric calcium that's usually good for orbital atherectomy. With rotational, if you only have access to rotational atherectomy, you can create a different wire bias by exchanging out the floppy wire for a rotostiff wire. If a few runs go smoothly, you may consider a slower speed to get the orbital motion, but I would really cons uh, urge caution here. And then it's important to follow it with a cutting or sculpting balloon to ensure good cracking of the lesion. Finally, with laser, you have a photon ablation with release of expanding and exploding bubbles that press over the plaque. We usually use saline here, but this can be magnified with blood or contrast. This is good for the treatment of uncrossable or undilatable lesions, but the, with the increasing amounts of calcium, there's decreased efficacy, and so at this point, you would consider needing a contrast to create larger uh, bubbles. And then last, the lithoplasty balloon is a pulsatile 1 hertz mechanical en uh, energy that's delivered by miniaturized emitters along a semi-compliant rapid exchange balloon. These vibrations are meant to crack not just the superficial, but also the deep layers of calcium. And so they can have an effect on that deep, deep wall calcium as well. The efficacy of the lithoplasty balloon is proportional to the calcium burden. So you'll see that with severe calcification, you'll have a greater chances of fracturing the calcium. Here's just an example. You can see the heavily, heavily calcified lesion in the prox LED on, on several views. After a lithoplasty balloon, uh, and further uh, optimization with a non-compliant balloon. Finally, with you can see that there is great stent uh, uh, deployment and IVUS confirmed good expansion. Here's another example. This is a, a lesion in the mid-RCA where you wouldn't necessarily, you would be cautious of wanting to put an atherectomy device along this tortuous bend. And so with the guideliner support, we're able to do lithoplasty, uh, further expand it with a non-compliant balloon, and then play, place a stent uh, with uh, good results and without risking perforation around the bend. Is this the end? Not quite. Don't forget to image at the end to ensure stent expansion. I would argue that you really should image before stent deployment to ensure good expansion of the lesion, but you absolutely must uh, image after the stent is deployed to ensure great apposition or expand and expansion. And if not, you should really consider super high pressure balloons. I'll go up to 30 atmospheres and not think twice about it. Okay, thank you very much.